Hi, and welcome to another uh, episode of In the Studio. I'm Alex Silva Satter, your host today, and I'm here with Chi Smith. And Chi is a refugee from Vietnam. Uh, she's been here since uh, 13? 1975. 1975. Yeah. She fled right, uh, literally, on a helicopter at one point, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, from Vietnam. Perhaps you're familiar with those images uh, from the documentaries and stuff. Um, and she's here to tell us a little bit today about what it was like um, growing up in Vietnam and uh, how things sort of deteriorated. So welcome to the show, Chi. Thank, Thank you, Thank you for Alex. coming in and uh, speaking with us. Um, so you left at the age of 13? Correct, In yeah. 75. Could you tell us what it was like growing up in Vietnam? And so I um, had a very... Uh, sheltered and protective childhood. My father was always uh, in uh, an officer in the army, and um, he got promoted in the ranks. And when we left in '75, he was a colonel. But I've always had a, a very um, uneventful, except for uh, yeah. one life attempt on our family. But other than that, it's a very um, sheltered and privileged. Um, upbringing because having a father who's a colonel and a commanding officer we had all the protection that we needed um, and so you know kids at school always approached me with certain um, they, they sort of drew a Deference. buffer yeah, yeah they and and, and it's it's a double-edged sword because they would think well you're doing well because the teachers would give you preferences because your father was a colonel. So, you know, we have the privileges, but then on the other hand, people would, uh, you know, readily assuming that, you know, discrediting right. my your own achievement. achievement. Right. But uh, we've always had a very, you know, upbringing that's it's, it's very good, even though war was going on around us. And, mm -hmm. um, it escalated, the war escalated to the height of uh, 1968, as you all know, uh, being called the Tet Offensive, and, mm -hmm. and that was the height. And ever since then, um, you know, we suffer a lot of shelling at night, not during the day, mm -hmm. but at night. So our bedroom was a sheltered bedroom, a bomb shelter. And you, wow. you wouldn't know it but by looking at it, but it would have sandbags in the wall and then steel plates on each side and the, the ceiling was the same way. And wow. so that was what we, where we slept. And before that, we had to run at night when we hear the siren and the shelling, we would run from our bedroom, which, mm -hmm. which was in the shelter then, to my mom's bedroom which was a shelter so imagine just waking up in the middle of the night disoriented and you just hear the shelling um, so when we were in our own shelter bedroom and hear the shelling which happened very frequently after 1968 um, we lived in Da Nang then I, li uh, I slept on the bunk top bunk I would jump out and go under the underneath this, this uh, bottom. the bottom one and my brother and I we just heard hur you know hurdle you know, huddled together. Right. And, you know, I know that there are times I would be crying and he would, you know, try to comfort me. Um, so it's very, you know, we normalize war because we mm -hmm. grew up during this wartime. That was what, all we knew. So and then wake up in the morning, woke up in the morning, and life was as usual, get dressed, went to school, and life as usual. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in the confines of, you know, we had protective life, but then we had to deal with, you know, the attempted on our lives and mm -hmm. with the shelling. And uh, my father, when he came home, he never had a scheduled regular visit home. Mm -hmm. it, it was always unannounced because he didn't want to be sniped at. Mm -hmm. There was no regular of anything back then. And one of the things I wished for was to have a father stay-at-home father. I, I saw other civilian friends who had their their dads staying at home, and I never had that. But so going from that, um, so any so the war escalated, and um, March 28, 1975, mm -hmm. um, my mom, she had, she's very astute, and she listened to what's going on around her, and of course with my dad 
um, advice, she packed up all of our things. Mm -hmm. And things that, oh, don't use that because we're saving him for, you know, good occasions or whatever. Right. So all those things were packed up, ready to go. March 28th, we we're supposed to go um, to the helipad and having our family from there to the shipyard where we're going to board the ship to go to a hometown near Tran. It just we're basically further south in Vietnam. Yeah, so we're traveling down the coast basically. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that was actually too late because all the refugees are moving south from way and and northern um, cities and provinces. So they jammed the street, and so it took forever for us to go from our home to the helipad. And that was the first time I saw chaos and. Uh, you know, kids, I mean, and I didn't see the dead bodies, but my, my older siblings did, and they would mm -hmm. cover our eyes. They didn't want us to see it because there's a lot of refugee coming south. It was chaos. It was uh, kids playing in the traffic light booths, and so it was, there was no law and order by then. So mm -hmm. we finally got to the helipad that was supposed to be reserved for the colonel's family, where there were people on there already. So our people had to kind of get them off and then we climb on there and that was the first time I witnessed anything remotely um, you know warlike because it's just right. until that point I lived a pretty safe protective life so the helicopter took us to the shipyard but by then there was thousands of people there and I don't know how they even beat us there but they were there and from there we could just feel our lives changing drastically because mm -hmm. we didn't have enough food or water. We waited from the morning to night, and then the ship was supposed to come in that night, and so we didn't have a sh we didn't have shelter. So we were just sitting outside of the buildings, and then a soldier was kind enough to say, "Oh, here, this is the office." So we went in there, and then that late at night, the shelling started. You know, uh, um, we can hear it, coming. the whistling coming in, and you can hear the impact of it hitting. And uh, again, the soldier, another soldier came in and like a guardian angel got us to leave and say to my dad, you know, the ship is here. It's time right. for you to move. And so imagine all nine of us, you know. So you had that's nine all. people in your family. Yeah. So my parents and the seven kids and we're just like moving uh, along other people and then we stepped on other people, other people stepped on us, we got hit. And my poor little sister, Hong Cho, my dad had a little Samsonite, uh, a hard shell Samsonite mm -hmm. case, and he was running with her. So it, every time they they ran together, it would hit her, and she would cry because you know it oh, hurt. Yeah. And then of course I lost my shoe. Um, one I lost one shoe, so I kicked the other one off because can't run with one shoe. It was it was a kind of a clog, mm -hmm. and uh, bad shoes to wear. But anyhow, so that was the first time I felt like, you know, I'm starting to lose my dignity, my you know, you can just feel the everything. Yeah, has everything is just slowly just like falling away from me. I, you know, we had a very prestigious, you know, um, life and high status for, from. And then we could just every time we, I, I felt like every time I ran, every step was like, you know, we we're shedding our identity. Mm -hmm. Shedding everything that we knew that was that defined us, and mm -hmm. but luckily, we got on. Um, it's a t uh, it's a tug and barge, I believe. It wasn't a mm -hmm. ship. We thought it was going to be a ship, but it wasn't. So we finally got on there. All of I mean, imagine having nine of us, and the littlest one was five, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to get through the cables. And so we had to shove her on there, and she cried like crazy. But anyway, so, I mean, there's a, there's a chasm between the boat and the deck, right? Mm -hmm. So if we fell, it's a long way. There's no return if you fell on that. And it's dark. It was supposed to be full moon, but, you know, we couldn't see anything around us. You know, just we, my dad would call our name, and that's how he got all of us, you know? Mm -hmm. Instead of visual, it was just calling our names. Anyhow, we got on there. And that was the beginning of our journey. Um, just to make the journey sh short, because you can read the, the book later and mm -hmm. get the details. But from there, we go from uh, so the tug and barge to the naval ship the next day. They would mm -hmm. get us. Um, and then from there, we'd go on a truck. And from there, we would 
uh, go and you know have some rest, you know, day rest, and Working then we would way go, yeah. South and so exactly, just follow the coastline. So Vietnam is a S shape, and it's like the size of California in totality, north and uh. south. And so that kind of gives you an idea. Sense of the scale. Yeah. So you're working your way all the way down. Yeah. Just think of it as an S. By fishing boat, by truck, by however you yeah. can get. Yeah. So one, at one point, it was four days on a, on a fishing boat. And we, there was no space to sleep. We just slept on, you know, fishing nets and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so from there, with various other transportations and trips, we finally yeah. were able to leave Vietnam, uh, April 25th, that was five days before the fall of Saigon. Um, and, then, and then making our way to America. So we went from, you know, a very protective, prestigious life to starting at the bottom, social mm -hmm. economic bottom rung. Right. And, but we were, we were very grateful and we were very happy. And we knew that because we have our dignity and our freedom and our health and our whole family, except for the two brothers who were stuck behind, um, that we would, we would take any job, you know, mm -hmm. just to advance ourselves. And, and education was our ticket out of poverty. And that experience, knowing that things were, that you had lost that much and that the other people yeah. had it worse, did that help you? Um, Absolutely. And as in America, obviously, you had difficulties, yeah. you know, growing up here yeah. with the prejudice and things. So what kind of strength were you able to draw from that experience that helped you get through the difficulties right. here? That's a great question. So um, my mom was the kind of person that other refugees back home, it, you mm -hmm. know, so uh, during the war, there were a lot of refugees within during our the country. War. The mm -hmm. whole war. So they lost their homes. They would come and they would go to my mom and my mom would give them food, shelter for the night or whatever, and send them on their way. And so for us to have this reversal of fortune um, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, obviously the, a difficult um, situation for anybody. Of course, I was 13, so that was tough, but that was nothing. We were, we had that um, sense of um, independence and so much pride because of where we came from, you mm -hmm. know, being the colonel's family. We, we had so much pride that we weren't going to take handouts. We were going to climb back up somehow. And we were for just um, uh, you know, immediate gratification. Uh, we believe in delayed gratification. And I think that was the strength that was instilled or, or the lessons um, that was instilled in us is that there's nothing mm -hmm instant you know you have to right. work hard and prove yourself so that you would get to the the place of um, helping others and when mm -hmm. you make it remember to help others behind you so that was always the lessons mm -hmm. that my parents gave because um, they're very anthrop they're uh, philanthropic people mm -hmm. um, so that was that and that's the way we were raised and so having that difficulty we knew it was only a transient um, state of being, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we know we're Buddhist, so we know that it's always the only uh, uh, constant is change, right? So mm -hmm. um, knowing that really helps us. So when you, even though when we're in a hard, difficult place without, you know, uh, our, our cultural identity, our social, economic, right. you know, all of that was stripped away, but we knew that if we would just hang in there and be patient. Um, the constant change, would come yeah, that, that state of mind helps us to navigate forward. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. it does. And so do you think that obviously you eventually worked for the state of, yes. and in emergency services for refugees in a sense? So that's a out? great question. That's, uh, so I um, served uh, with the governor's office of emergency services, and I was a GIS chief. So what mm -hmm. um, my team- That's geographical information services yeah, for anyone. Yeah, so that's online mapping for response. So mm -hmm. when there's any incident, man-made or natural, so I was there for the Napa earthquake and mm -hmm. for the big fires a couple of years ago. So mm -hmm. our job is to make sure that we have online real-time information so that other agencies uh, can work with us in the FEMA counties, Coordinate their response. Exactly. And 
So that has always been, ever since I've been helped in Guam with the Red Cross and the Marines, how they fed us and they received us with kindness. And I remember eating the first McDonald hamburger. That was the greatest and I thought, you know, when you're hungry and tired and cold and they give us blankets and pillows and, and treat us with, you know, kindness and we, our dignity was intact. Then and there, I, I promised myself that I would not forget and I would do my part to help others in need. So fast forward, I worked at the emergency services uh, office. I helped the disaster refugees. So those albeit then they're not war refugees, right. but if they're being taken away from their home and all of a sudden, you know, the comfort of home right. is gone and all they have is what they have on their back, right? So, you know, for in that moment in time, they need others to, to take, not take care of them, but give them the, um, the provisions and mm -hmm. the clothes and uh, the basics and necessities. So in that moment in time, I was able to, help the agency, coordinating with them right. to help the people in need. And it made me feel really good that I'm actually, you know, playing my part. back. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you've also, you, and then you've written a book about these experiences uh, called mm -hmm. Tiger Fish. So if anyone is interested in learning more about uh, her experiences or the book, um, you can go to chi being chi, correct? Dot com. Dot, dot com. Correct. Uh, that's C-H-I being chi. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your experience with us, uh, and uh, it's incredible. <laughs> thank you, know, all you the Alex. the things you've been yeah. through, and thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alex. It's my pleasure. And uh, that wraps up another episode of In the Studio. Uh, join us next time when we'll talk about other something. <laughs>